All right, everyone. Uh, so again, my name is William Biersack from the Office of Online Learning at Mount St. Mary College, and welcome to putting the discussion in forums, which is the first uh, fall webinar of the 2017-2018 academic uh, year at Mount St. Mary College. Um, and uh, welcome. Uh, so just a few notices before we get started. Um, this webinar is being recorded now, and we will be sending you a link to this recording with some additional resources after the webinar has ended. You are not required to speak through the microphone or use your webcam during this webinar, and we will have time for questions at the end of this presentation. So at that time, please ask us any questions using the chat feature that we just used for the sound check. And so without further ado, I would like to introduce Peter Wachowski from the Division of Arts and Letters, who will be delivering today's webinar. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, uh, Billy, and um, thank you for attending, those of you who are. Um, my name is Peter Witkowski, as you've heard. I'm an associate professor of English in the Division of Arts and Letters. I'm also the director of freshman writing, which means that I teach quite a few first-year courses, including the fully online section of forms of literature we've offered for the past four summers. Now, while it's true that I had been using eClass pretty consistently prior to taking on the online summer course, it wasn't until I was planning for that fully online experience in 2014 that I first began to think seriously about discussion forums, as I knew that these would have to serve as substitutes for the give and take of a traditional classroom. By titling this Lunch and Learn webinar, Putting the Discussion in Forums, you might say that I'm acknowledging what to some will seem painfully obvious that the discussion in discussion forums is not guaranteed. I'll admit further and candidly that I don't feel I've entirely mastered the art of facilitating worthwhile discussions among my students. Possibly it's an art that no one can master entirely. However, I have learned some valuable lessons these past four summers that I don't mind sharing. I hope those participating will feel comfortable sharing their own experiences, which I invite you to do by typing in questions or comments using the chat feature, as Billy just explained. In the meantime, let's get started. I built it. Why didn't they come? Clearly, there can be no discussion in discussion forums if students aren't participating. In 2014, even I wasn't so naive as to think I didn't have to create incentives for participation, whether framing these as rewards or as punishments. Quite a few of my colleagues, people I genuinely admire, have told me they never assign a grade for class participation, citing a variety of reasons. But I have no such qualms, whether in an online or traditional format. Every one of my course outlines says, in this or in similar language. Merely attending class or logging in will earn you at most X number of points. If you are prepared and seem attentive but don't join the conversation when given the opportunity, you will earn X plus Y. To earn X plus Y plus Z, in other words, full credit, you will need to do more, demonstrating that your absence at any given point would be noticed and regretted by the rest of us. Online courses, whatever their other challenges may be, make this part of the assessment markedly easier. In a traditional course, I never want to rely on my memory alone to distinguish levels of participation, but it's also hard to make notes when a discussion is ongoing or when in the moments just after class students are crowding around with questions or another instructor is eager to take possession of the room. In an online course, it's as simple as generating a report or scanning the names in a thread. But this is all the more reason to make expectations of every sort clear from the start. The time will eventually come when I need to look at each student's level of participation objectively and decide whether it is excellent or good or merely adequate. If I wait until it's time to make the assessment to decide what students will need to have done to earn a particular grade, I won't have given students a fair opportunity to earn that grade. Incidentally, while sticks have been more likely to have been my default mode than carrots have been in my initial course designs, I've increasingly known the benefits of the positive reinforcement discussion forums permit. In that fully online forms of literature course I've taught now for the past four summers, 
dedicating an optional forum to recommendations for future readings both introduces me to texts I might never have heard of otherwise and affords the students who participate in it a way of mitigating a disappointing quiz performance or a late submission. In the various courses I teach in a traditional format, I've likewise experimented with positive incentives that take the shape of optional discussion forums. I found that such a forum is a wonderfully convenient way to get first-year students to reflect on FYE programs they attend, especially when those programs are linked to course content, but even when they're not. In Modern American Grammar, I invite students to post about things they encounter in their everyday lives while watching television or listening to the radio, at their jobs or in the locker room that connect in some way with the material we go over in class. If I knew I needed to incentivize participation in discussion forums back in 2014, I was also mostly ignorant of what my options were. It turned out that there were five, as described on the current slide, in language I've taken in substance from an e-class help screen. That first summer, I went with the default option, the standard forum, which in truth is a very good choice for many or even most situations. In the years since, both in online and traditional courses, I found that the question and answer forum is often preferable, particularly for discussions in which I'm trying to gauge a student's immediate, unexamined response to a question or an issue. This past summer, for example, I created what I called a question of the week forum that introduced issues somewhat off to one side of the assigned material and that invited students to take a position in a possibly polarizing debate. In one such discussion, I revealed to them a surprising fact about a poet we had read that week, essentially upending what we thought we knew about a specific poem's authenticity. I also use a question and answer for my icebreaker forum in which I ask students to write a six-word memoir that weeks later they will have an opportunity to develop into a fixed-form poem. In both cases, I'd prefer that students refrain from sneaking a peek at other students' posts to check the temperature of the room in the question of the week or to model their memoir on what someone else has already said. That's not the point, and the question and answer form removes the temptation. Of course, one disadvantage of this type of forum is that there are bound to be students who never return to the forum to check out what others have posted, although that, I suppose, can be remedied by requiring a follow-up post of some kind. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, what I call keeping tabs. And as I say, a simple calendar is a good place to start. Probably the biggest challenge I've faced, and I imagine others also face in working with discussion forums, is keeping track of participation and assessing it in a way that is both transparent and fair, while also encouraging students to keep their initial momentum going or to step up their performance, as the case may be. I like to begin with a simple calendar of deadlines on my printable course outline that emphasizes the weekly routine which I am also careful not to alter except in response to individual requests. With my online course usually spanning the July 4th weekend, I made the mistake the first year of extending the deadlines for discussion forum posts and quizzes for that week and was surprised by how much confusion and consternation it caused. One student actually told me I was setting her up for failure when I didn't make a similar extension the following week a criticism I didn't think was fair, but one that I nonetheless took to heart enough to vow not to leave myself open to it again. What you're looking at on the slide is the calendar for the first week of the course. With the exception of the icebreaker at the top and the updated profile at the bottom, both of which are first week activities, each line represents a recurrent deadline, color-coded for consistency and easy reference. For each week, running Monday through Sunday, Students must make an initial forum post in response to a prompt from me by the end of the day Wednesday. They then have Thursday and Friday to review what their peers have posted and must post again, ideally getting a genuine conversation going with one or more of their peers by Saturday. So that's a calendar. Keeping tabs also means that rubrics will help to distinguish levels of participation. So in my online summer course, five weeks in duration in 2017, discussion forum participation was worth 25 points in total, 
25% of the final course grade with five points allocated to the question of the week and the remaining 20 points allocated to small group discussions which were worth five points per week spread out over four weeks. On this next slide, I've reproduced sections of the corresponding grading rubric. I found such rubrics invaluable not only for communicating to students whether or not their contributions to the discussion forums are living up to my expectations, but also for keeping track myself of what, if all is going well, can quickly turn into a complicated web of interwoven conversations. On the left-hand side, you'll see the general guidelines I give students initially, which I'll refine and clarify, if need be, for individual students or for the class as a whole as the course progresses. These guidelines are, to be honest, much less specific than the guidelines I provided the first couple of years I taught this course when I adapted for the purpose a much more text-heavy sample rubric the Office of On Online Education had generously provided as part of my training. It's not just that I believe students are more likely to read a little bit of text than a lot. I felt I also wanted to do, to do more to distinguish the categories numerically. And so on the right-hand side, you'll see that I've given a range of scores to correspond to the first three descriptive headings, exemplary, impressive, and developing. As with all of my rubrics, I grade only at the top of the range from the 60% that represents minimal competence say 1.2 points out of 2 or 6 tenths of a point out of 1 from minimal competence to full credit in a given row. In this particular rubric, developing represents a range that includes minimal competence to a low C. Impressive represents C, C plus, B minus, and B, while exemplary begins at B plus and includes A minus, A, and A plus. So on this next slide, I'm showing you what um, I see, actually, um, what helps me to keep track, because I print off such a um, rubric for all students um, and then make notations in it as things are going along. I can record my assessment of discussion forum participation from week to week, and I do also send it to students regularly, weekly, um, as feedback. While it may be tempting to focus only on monitoring forum activity while conversations are ongoing, and of course adding my own voice to the discussion, I found that if I wait until the end of the week to begin the assessment, it's much harder to sort things out than if I'm making quick notations all along. Then as the weeks progress, I always have an easy way of recalling individual student participation at a glance. This helps to ensure that the feedback entered in the space for notes is consistent. I can easily compare or contrast a given week's participation with participation from prior weeks without having go to go back to the actual threads to refresh my memory. So you're probably asking, what about the actual discussions? Much of what I've said so far has been focused on encouraging participation in discussion forums at a very basic level in terms of meeting a course requirement. For conscientious students who take their grades seriously, attaching a weight to the exercise is all that's needed to get their full attention and effort. But students are not equally conscientious or grade conscious, clearly, and sometimes even the extent of a student's prior experience with discussion forums ends up being a deciding factor in how satisfactorily the discussions develop. Certain ingrained habits, not necessarily unique to the online course environment, may likewise insert themselves and wreak havoc with the best laid plans. In what time remains, I'd like to single out a few of the more problematic habits I routinely encounter when working with discussion forums and briefly reflect on ways I've dealt with them. Note that in doing so, I've embodied the problems in a series of fictitious students who are aggressively one-dimensional, the modern campus descendants of another generation's personified virtues and vices, or of familiar stock characters in fiction or melodrama. I am, of course, aware that no student is actually one-dimensional. I mean no offense in short, and I hope sincerely none will be taken. So we have first the 11th hour poster. As a lifelong procrastinator and someone who is always confident there will be enough time until the instant it becomes clear that there won't be enough time, believe me, I get these students. 
I won't tell you how long I procrastinated on this very webinar, but Billy might once we're finished. In virtually every discussion forum I've ever created for a course, I've encountered students who consistently wait until the last possible moment to fulfill an obligation, not stopping to consider that a satisfying conversation is very unlikely to develop under such circumstances. I accept that it's on me to carefully spell out the timeline for acceptable participation, but doing so can be difficult, particularly in online courses where the appeal for so many students is the freedom to do work on their own time and at their own pace. Certainly every summer I've taught the online forms of literature course, I've had to pull aside at least a few students, so to speak, to let them know that asynchronous doesn't actually mean without deadlines. That, for example, I require reading quizzes to be completed comparatively early in the week, but not too early, so that students will have a strong incentive to read the required material in advance of the time they have to make their initial forum posts, which themselves, it seems obvious, really need to be completed before things can move forward as they need to. So the obstacle to satisfying discussion forum discussions in this case is bad timing. Short of micromanaging deadlines and setting up what at least some students will undoubtedly regard as unreasonable windows for posting, what's one to do? It's possible, of course, just to set things up and take a wait-and-see attitude. If the course is large enough and there are enough students logging in at various times, it might work out in the end. I don't know, though. I hate the thought of students making follow-up posts that even they probably realize no one but me is going to read great insightful posts in some cases, taking deductions for online conduct and hoping for better the following week. I've come to think that dividing the class in groups, fixed groups or else more fluid ones, is the best solution for dealing with the problem of 11th hour posters. On the one hand, if the situation persists, at least it's confined. A group of four or five can surely withstand the periodic disappearance of a member or even two. Persuading those who are MIA to make more of an effort to post ahead of the final deadline is, I think, easier when small groups are involved, since there's a greater likelihood that the students will get to know one another, especially if the composition of groups is fixed rather than fluid. Another strategy I've contemplated but not actually taken yet is to require students in groups to communicate with each other on the subject of their group participation. That is, I've thought I could ask them to compare schedules and look for opportunities to maximize the back and forth among themselves, making private commitments to post by a certain time and then to come back later to check in. I think I'd even be willing to have them tell me how far into the weekend I should allow the window for posting to remain open. But as I say, I haven't tried that yet. I'm thinking about that. The next type of student I have is the agreeing, agreeable, agreer. A second problem or obstacle embodied once again by an all too familiar stereotype. I know you know the kind of student I'm talking about. This one is likely to be the polar opposite of the 11th hour poster in terms of visibility within the forum. She or he is all over the forum, delivering encouraging and usually short messages of uncomplicated, enthusiastic agreement. I know what you mean. I thought the same thing. You are so right about that. Again, what to do? In giving my prior example, I may have made it sound as if I function only as a silent observer of discussion forums, when of course I post frequently, and I like to think strategically. Dealing with this AAA type poster definitely requires strategy. I'm reluctant, first of all, to respond to each and every short comment of this sort requesting clarification not just because of the number of posts that that would involve, but because having to answer having an answer to that particular question is not likely to move the conversation very far forward. So I'm more likely to pose a more open-ended, even seemingly unrelated question, and probably one addressed to the entire small group or to the class as a whole, as the case may be. Another strategy I've had some success with precludes or at least postpones the agreeers, agreeable agreement by requiring the initial dialogue to be in a question and answer format. I don't mean the question and answer forum, and in fact that particular type of forum probably isn't a good fit here since it prevents users from seeing what others have posted in a given thread 
until they're posted themselves. In a standard format, I'll ask for questions first from everyone, say two or three questions, the more open-ended the better, about elements of the assigned reading in the initial post. Follow-up posts then begin with each student doing his or her best to answer at least one question posed by each small group member, or if there are no small groups, then a few questions posed by the class taken as a whole. Those who ask the questions are then expected to follow up. One hopes doing more than saying, exactly, that's what I thought too. So the third final category of student is Mr. or Ms. shortest stitch distance from point B to point A. This last student will be familiar to at least some of you, even if the name I've given him or her is less immediately communicative. I'll give you a hint. The point A the student is taking a shortcut to is the desired grade of A, where the shortcut consists of nothing more than directing all or most forum posts to me. One version of this student, but not the only version, is the slightly older student who within the first week or so finds an opportunity to tell me how interesting it is trying to communicate with the other students in the class who all seem so young. Truth be told, I'm old enough myself to be flattered by the idea that a 25 or 27 year old has an easier time communicating with me than with 19 or 21 year olds. But I still find myself urging such students to make an effort. When the pattern continues and the only posts he or she makes are in direct response to my questions, I'm not above posing my questions in the form of direct requests to the other students to weigh in on something shortest distance has said to me. But as I say, the slightly older student is only one version of this particular embodied trait. It's probably a natural tendency in all students to pay attention to what the person responsible for assessing them has to say. Some may even feel an obligation to reply to me directly, lest they ac be accused later on of coming up short. I guess my point in identifying this particular type of student in closing out this webinar is to underscore what, at least for me, is a significant difference between the courses I teach in a traditional format, where discussion forums are more or less secondary to the in-class discussion I spend so much psychic energy trying to maximize, and the online courses make that the online course I teach, which relies on discussion forums in a much more essential way. In the traditional courses, there is obviously room for one-to-one -one interaction, in office visits, for example, and even more so in the feedback I give to students about the formal and informal writing they do for me. But the classroom interaction I've become so used to over the years is so overwhelmingly, and let's be honest, so effortlessly communal that students have the benefit of experiencing multiple perspectives struggling to find common ground, even if they sit there passively, never saying a word. In the online format, discussion forums, to the extent that they compel students to join the conversation, ideally not with me alone, have incredible potential, but they do take work on both sides. I hope my reflections on the subject this afternoon have provided food for thought while you've enjoyed your lunch. I'm curious to know what obstacles you've encountered and your strategies for dealing with them. Also, whether the student types I've identified are in line with your experiences. Are there other types worth talking about? I welcome any and all questions. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you so much, Peter, for uh, presenting today. Um, at this point in the presentation, if anyone has any questions uh, regarding the presentation or maybe any uh, personal interests with regards to uh, discussion forums on, in online classwork, um, please take this time to enter those questions in the chat box. Um, and also, if you are interested in receiving a link to the recording of this session, as well as any other resources that we have available, uh, could you please enter your preferred email address into the chat box as well? Thank you. And I see Daniel is typing. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. If if I could fill up a moment while people are thinking, you know, I, I wondered whether anyone was curious why I didn't include 
the uh, hostile student as a um, possible type of problem to be dealt with. <laughs> so I'm anticipating the question you haven't asked. And um, my answer to my own question is that I haven't really encountered such students. In fact, I was concerned. I think I was genuinely concerned, th the, especially in the online class, that I would have to deal with um, mediating disputes. And uh, it's been really rare. I can, I can give a couple of examples of um, when it, it's happened in a traditional class, a poetry class, where I was actually well aware of the prickly dynamic from fact, factions on different sides of the room. And it, it did burst forth one day in a discussion forum where a student I won't name, lest you know who I mean, um, called out another student for misusing a word of all things. And uh, I felt I had to intervene, um, not only in the discussion forum, but in class afterwards. But that's been just so rare. Um, Anyway, I, I, I'm, I am curious whether whether those of you who have used discussion forums have encountered different types of problems. So Daniel types, um, do you have issues with perceptions of subjectivity with your rubrics? That's a good question. You know, I, the truth is, I, I wish I could get more students to pay attention to what the rubrics say. Um, I, I can't think of a single example of a student challenging me on, you know, the grade that I've assigned for a, a given uh, task. You know, if I've if I've labeled something, say, um, developing, you know, rather than um, exemplary, they seem to get that, you know, and, and as I pointed out a few moments ago, I felt like the range of scores that I had introduced were, were familiar to them. They know what a B plus is or an A minus. I get a lot of questions about subjectivity when I, when I teach a class, any sort of class, and, uh, and a student argues that that's my opinion, you know, and, and uh, their opinion is the same as mine, or it says convincing, which it is or it isn't, I guess. It is an open question. Dan, do you have um, questions with rubrics that way? It, it, Dan's pointing out migrating toward the top. I mean, all I mean by that, I, I don't, I, I certainly don't want to create any confusion, is that I don't. I don't make uh, distinctions for levels of failure, that something is either adequate or it's not. And I, I really rarely assign a zero for something. Usually it's when something's missing, like a required post or you know, uh, in an essay, if there was supposed to be a bibliography and there's no bibliography, um, that seems like a no-brainer. Um, but on a rubric, I'll very rarely give less than 60%. 60% is pretty bad. You know, and then that allows me to make distinctions, you know, in the gradable range. Thanks, Regina. I appreciate your participating. Arts and Letters is the best, if I can say that. Are there any other questions, observations? I recommend that you uh, talk to Kristen or Billy about doing this, because this was a lot of fun, and it's a wonderful opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much.